Namaskar and welcome to Candid Conversation. Our guest tonight is Mr. K. V. Chaudhary, the Central Vigilance Commissioner of India. And we celebrate the Vigilance Week, the Vigilance Awareness Week, which has the 31st of October in it. And this time the week starts with the 31st of October, which is the birthday of our first Home Minister, Sadbar Vallabha Patel, the Iron Man of India. And to tell us a little more about not only Vigilance Week, but the whole purpose of trying to make India a corrupt free society, we have with us Mr. Chaudhary himself. Uh, this year the theme is public participation in promoting integrity and in eradicating corruption. If we look at the public itself, how much do they contribute, sir, to creating corruption? Uh, Namaskar. The Central Vigilance Commission every year conducts this Vigilance Awareness Week through which it brings awareness among not only its employees but the public at large on the issues relating to corruption, integrity, bribery and other issues. So last year, for example, we did preventive vigilance as a tool for good governance. So our theme was that uh, you prevent things from happening so that you don't regret that things have happened. So how do you prevent corruption? That was the issue. This year we have taken up the topic of uh, public participation. I am reminded of a old saying, if you have to clap, you need two hands. Yeah. Corruption is also something similar to that. If there is a person who is not prepared to pray something beyond the legal price he has to pay, let's say for application of a license, Somebody has to pay a license fee, yes, he has to pay the license fee, it goes to the government, that's a rule. But if the officer concerned or an intermediary is expecting some more payment or some other benefit and I am not willing to pay as a member of public, then the transaction doesn't get completed. I know I may suffer, I may not, uh, uh, you know, get the license or it may be delayed or may have some problems, right. but the fact is that the corruption aspect doesn't get completed. So we would like this time the public to be aware that it is not enough to complain. It is not enough to uh, say that there is a lot of corruption. But each one of us resolve that we are not going to be part of a corrupt activity. And next, if a corrupt activity has come to my notice, I will bring it to the notice of the people concerned. And for that, uh, in fact, uh, this time you have two pledges, one for individuals and the other for organizations. Yes. How important are these pledges and what do you hope to achieve with them? Uh, it's more of a moral commitment, reiterating one's own faith in the system, reiterating one's own faith in his own ethical standards. It is a voluntary pledge, both for the individuals, rather the citizens, as well as the organizations. There is no compulsion on anybody. People who are in constitutional positions, people who are in statutory positions, people who are in government jobs, all have taken a more rigorous pledge. Right. Maybe once when they assume the office or repeatedly like every time we have the Vigilance Awareness Week, it starts with the taking an integrity pledge by the government servants and public servants. But from the public side, we would like them to be a part of this and let them express their resolve so that let's say a few crores of people say that I have taken this pledge and I am going to be an honest person, I am not going to be a part of any corrupt activity. It will influence the others who are on the borderline or maybe occasional uh, slipping from doing that. And the other thing is having signed a pledge, it somewhere pricks in my mind, it pricks in my heart if I have to do something which is contrary to the pledge. Right. So it's a voluntary compliance mechanism. There is no compulsion. Nobody is going to get an award or a reward for that. But it is just that I love my country. This is what I am going to be. If I am like this, my country is going to be something better than what it is today. So uh, how serious is the problem of corruption in our country? Because, you know, I mean, people have casually said institutionalized corruption, you know, while describing the systems that function. Uh, is that really the case? The corruption is several uh, ways it is there. 
One is the grand corruption. The grand corruption is the big issues where a policy decision is made or a huge purchase of a, a defense equipment is made or some such thing or a project is going to be located. What affects most people is the transactional level corruption. Suppose you go to pay your municipal tax or you go to uh, apply for a municipal license to build a house or modify your house or you go for a driving license, you go for a passport, you go to the income tax office to get your refund. That's where most people are affected directly. The grand corruption does affect and it affects very badly but people don't feel it immediately. So what the commission thinks is that the corruption is all pervasive, like its effects are all pervasive, let me put it this way. After the introduction of the di direct benefit transfer DBT, then the services and the goods are reaching much more efficiently to the actual beneficiaries. Right. Now earlier we have heard of things how these used to get frittered away mm -hmm. down the line. So that is another form of corruption. Yeah. So it does affect and it has very deep roots. So talking about those deep roots itself, sir, you know, I mean, we see power brokers, middlemen, coteries around, you know, alleged corrupt officials. What is the CVC? What can the CVC do to dismantle this kind of a nexus? As you are aware, the Central Vigilance Commission is primarily an advisory body to the government on the issues relating to corruption and anti-corruption. And it also supervises the work of the Central Bureau of Investigation, which is the prime investigating agency in this country, and also the center, I mean, uh, the chief vigilance officers in various central government and public sector undertakings. So whenever these instances of intermediaries whether you call them power brokers or whatever names, different departments have different uh, names, uh, come to our notice. We do ask the either the CBI or the CVOs to investigate into the matter. Each department has some kind of a list of undesirable persons who should be avoided, but these are advisories. But in a criminal misconduct involving an officer, with a power broker or an intermediary is noticed, then they are prosecuted. And for prosecuting them, you don't require the sanction of the government like it is required for the public servant. Intermediaries are totally different from power brokers. Like say for example, banks have a very big problem, had a very big problem of their acting on certain certificates of let's say valuation, certificate of um, uh, a balance sheet or a profit and loss account or a certificate of net worth and based on that they lend and later they find that these certificates are not genuine certificates. So while now under the general law or the IPC or CRPC the intermediaries can be taken to task, there is a call, there is a request uh, from various sections that these people who provide services to the government or the public sector undertakings should be included in the category of public servants or okay. public authorities so that if they do something wrong deliberately, the same rules which apply to the government servants Absolutely. can also be applied. Absolutely. Among some of the reasons given for corruption, you know, or the grand scale corruption is that uh, funding of political parties is from unknown sources. There's the belief that there's a lot of black money floating into this because there's a lot of money that is required to win elections. What is in your jurisdiction that can be done to curb this kind of flow of black money? Well, primarily it doesn't come in our jurisdiction in the sense that uh, we look at uh, uh, persons who are government servants or servants of the public sector enterprises. But as a perspective of a watchdog who is also connected with this, while the politics and the elections are not within the uh, purview of uh, or in which the government servants participate, uh, yes, it is generally believed that there is substantial uh, black money or the unaccounted money which flows into that. But I think with the introduction of the electoral trust and the funding being having been made somewhat more transparent. I think uh, a lot more of money uh, has come through the 
legal channels. Uh, and probably this trend, if it continues, probably over a period of time, uh, it will its effect will come down. Unaccounted money's effect will come down. You're watching Candid Conversation. We're going to take a short break at this point in time. We're discussing curbing corruption and the Vigilance Awareness Week with the Central Vigilance Commissioner, Mr. K.V. Chowdhury. Stay with us. Roshni ka sif ek hi naam. Surya. Surya LED. Kharcha kam, chale zada. Ghar ghar roshni ka wada. Surya! समझ गए सर? Good, very good. एक बार फिर करेंगे। भूका पाते ही खुली जगह में जाओ। ना जा पाए तो पहले झुको। सर को ढको। किसी चीज को मजबूती से पकड़ो या किसी कोने में सर ढककर खड़े हो जाओ। आप भी भूकंप से बचना सीखिए। तैयारी में है समझदारी। आपके हित में तत्पर इंडिया में। अपने अपने लाइफ की सबसे बड़ी मोमेंट लीड करने जा रहा हूँ, जो इंडिया के लिए बहुत जरूरी है। आपको खड़ा होना पड़ेगा मेरे साथ। टीम स्वच्छ भारत मिशन का हिस्सा बनकर, और हम सब मिलकर एक ऐसा इंडिया बनाएंगे, जहाँ हर कोई टॉयलेट यूज़ करता हो। क्योंकि जब सब टॉयलेट यूज़ करेंगे, तो सब प्रोग्रेस करे� I am strong. I like solving problems. Facing an enemy at a higher position is a problem. Being two points down is a problem. And the bigger the problem, the sweeter the victory. What do I like more? Going to battle or firing my pistol? I like the fact that I do both for India. We are India's most exciting workplace and we are making you an offer. The Indian Army. Live a life less ordinary. मकान बनाते समय लापरवाही भूकंप में महंगी पड़ सकती है भूकंप से ईंट या पत्थर की चुनाई वाले मकान में दरारें ना आए इसलिए आप लिंटल और प्लिंट लेवल पर और जोन पांच के मकान में सिल लेवल पर भी भूकंप पट्टियां लगवाएं हर कोने और जोड़ पर खड़े सरिये लगवाएं घर सुरक्षित तो आप सुरक्षित आपके हित में तत्पर एनडीए में बड़ी परेशान लग रही हो कुछ समझ नहीं आ रहा पहले तो शहर बदला घर बदला और अब यहाँ आधार में पता भी बदलना पड़ेगा नाम में सुधार या पता त्यागी बदलना इंटरनेट से घर बैठे संभव है तुम जो मोबाइल नंबर इस्तेमाल कर रही हो वो आधार में रजिस्टर तो है ना अब आधार की वेबसाइट uidai.gov.in पर जाकर नया एड्रेस टाइप करके अपना एड्रेस प्रूफ अपलोड कर दो ये तो सचमुच आसान है Welcome back. So the CAG audits the accounts, okay, and uh, but corruption, you know, controlling corruption seems to come under your control, at least, and the CBR also comes under your control as far as this is concerned. Now, these three Cs, how do they work in coordination to bring down corruption? Audit is uh, for us, or audit observations, could be a starting point for seeing whether there is a corruption, because audit is probably primarily concerned with seeing whether the public money has been spent for the purpose for which it has been allocated. But we do get indications from that. Uh, the CVC advises the government and the disciplinary authorities on the issues where there could be some corruption or issues relating to individuals. So we do have a close uh, network among us and we do exchange information. As far as CBC, CBI is concerned, we have a monthly review meeting in which cases relating to anti-corruption and cases registered under the PC Act are uh, discussed and the progress is monitored. With the CAG, their reports are regularly reviewed by us or rather uh, examined by us to see whether there is any vigilance angle. One of the important functions of our Chief Vigilance Officer is to examine the audit reports, both of the CAG as well as the statutory audit, and to see whether any corrective action from the vigilance side is required. So, but you know, as watchdogs of, uh, of society, of public money, uh, they, you may be putting the fear in a public servant that, you know, prevents him from acting in, uh, you know, in the interest of his job, actually to do his work. 
they may be frightened of taking decisions and this leads to bureaucratic inertia. Yeah. Is that a problem? So how do you watch uh, the right balance? Yes, uh, it is being frequently said that the fear of three C's or now it has increased to five C's uh, is making people not decide things or making people uh, uh, delay things. Uh, we have been saying all along that uh, what we require the officers or the administrators to do is that they should follow the laid down process. And if there is no laid down process for any particular act, they should first get a process laid down and then follow the process so that they are kind of a insulated from allegations. And every decision that is taken should be recorded in writing with some reasons so that there is transparency. Well, if somebody is making regularly mistakes of 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, then he needs to be trained. He needs to be put in a place where he doesn't have, need this kind of a skills. But if somebody is making these mistakes in full know of things and consciously, that's where a vigilance issue comes. So we in the commission try and distinguish between an error a negligence, an act of commission deliberately and a malafide. So either the proceedings or the penalties depend upon the gravity of this. And officers who have uh, financial powers have to get uh, vigilance clearance. Uh, now, I mean, is that sort of a blank check for them, you know, that they can, after they've got the vigilance clearance, they can act in whatever way they want? In the government, for appointments to any level of position, there is something called a vigilance clearance required. Uh, it could be a promotion even from the lowest level to the next higher level or it could be a promotion to the level of a highest level of a cabinet secretary or an appointment in a, a chief executive of a bank or whatever it is, highest. So there are uh, guidelines as to who should be given a vigilance clearance, who should not be given. Primarily, if a person, as on the date of the consideration, he is not facing any criminal charge or a RC or what you call FIR, etc., pending or a charge sheet pending, and there are no grave allegations under investigation, then a vigilance clearance is given. Now, vigilance clearance, you must remember, is as per record. On record, on today, is there any? investigation or a discipline proceeding pending. Who knows tomorrow something which he did five years back may come out and that may be a misconduct and he may be charged. So to say that since somebody has got a vigilance clearance, all his past misdeeds have been wiped out or he has been given a certificate of integrity right. is not correct. What about the public? How can they approach you? I mean, how much interaction does the CVC have with the public? Uh, CVC gets about nearly 60 to 70,000 complaints per year. Either it could be in hard copies or through the emails, etc. And we do get some people personally coming and giving some representations. But a good portion of these uh, do not relate to corrupt practices. They relate to deficiency in services or not getting some service. Somebody is not getting water in the tap or bijli thik nahi hai, etc. So we forward that kind of a petitions to the agency concern. But cases which involve a misconduct, a corruption, a irregularity, etc. relating to government, central government or public sector undertakings banks, insurance companies, or where the government has a 51 percent stake, right. or the projects being implemented by with central government money, then we take up for investigation either through the vigilance officers or through the CBI or by a committee of the government. And once we examine if misconducts or a clear vigilance angle surfaces, we either uh, take discipline proceedings against them or we take a criminal proceeding against them. And is there any uh, protection for the complainants? Because uh, yes. I mean, they may be, the, you know, it's a dangerous thing. We have thing what is called a whistleblower protection mechanism. It is called PP resolution. Okay. An act has also been passed, but it is yet to be notified. Under this, any person who makes this complaint, he should make a complaint in a sealed cover with a 
superscription of complaint made under the PP resolution or he can say whistleblower complaint and these complaints are opened only by the secretary, nobody else opens and we have a committee which goes through them and then they keep this complaint, I mean they see confirmation from the person, once he confirms the complaint, then the complaint its confirmation, the person, his details, everything is kept in the safe custody, it is locked up. Only the content is taken and we get the matter investigated so that the identity of the whistleblower is protected. But sometimes what happens is either out of over enthusiasm, the whistleblower sends the same complaint to many people okay. or he sometimes unwittingly mentions outside that my name is Kaya Karadia or worse, sometimes what happens is the complaint is of such a nature that somebody did not get a benefit or somebody got a benefit and somebody complained. So, you can reasonably probably make out that so and so could have complained. Right. So, we do try and help the people by kind of a uh, retracting some of the names etc. But still, if such thing is there and if the complainant perceives a threat or a fear, then we have also the power to provide him some kind of a security. Okay. Is that the same case, the same uh, provisions also apply to junior officers who are complaining against senior officers? Uh, well, junior officers complaining also is a subset of the same whistleblower mechanism, but then they may get identified. But we protect them against vigilance because he complained against the senior officer. We protect them from getting all the service benefits. We protect them that they are not harassed by the effect transfer, etc. We are in the digital age. Uh, you know, a lot of technology is being used. There's CCTV footage all over the place. There's a money trail that can be tracked. Uh, in this day and age, has, I mean, it must be easy to track corruption, isn't it? So people shouldn't be corrupt, one would say. We would like to put these more in use to prevent corruption, to prevent misconduct and certainly use them in those odd cases where we have to investigate. Like for example, if you take the coal sector, there used to be a huge embezzlement of coal when it is being transported from the mine to say the loading point. Okay. Now the coal sector companies, they have established GPRS enabled instruments. So now, from the monitoring cell, the coal company knows what is the track taken by the truck and it has to go only in the predetermined truck and there is also what is called a geofencing and as you rightly said, uh, the CCTVs have been installed in some places. Then as regards money trail, yes, we have also realized this, we send a lot of our officers for forensic uh, training so that they can trail monies they can trail uh, the transactions. Uh, already the public participation through RTI has, is helping in curbing corruption. What more can the public do, sir? The first thing the public have to say is that I am not going to be a part of this, any corrupt practice. Sometimes people are not even aware that a particular practice they are following is a corrupt practice. Take for example, you go to Earlier you used to go to buy a railway ticket, there is a huge queue, 100 people are standing, 50 people are standing. Some tout, come, some tout comes and says, uh, if you pay me 10 bucks, I will get you in 5 minutes. Right. And uh, many of us would have done that. Uh, Need to get onto the train. Yeah, yeah. Get it, give the 10 rupees and then he gets it. How he gets it, you do not get into it. He may have a tie up with the ticket issuer or some such thing. Right. Now it is certainly a cut practice. Similarly, there are similar several such instances. What we would like public to be aware is that doing something at the expense of somebody else, doing something which puts you at an unfair advantage compared to somebody else is something that could be a corrupt practice. We want people to raise their voice. We want people to say that, look, this is what is happening in so-and-so organization. So that at least some of these by fear of the reporting itself they get uh, avoided. In those odd which are still there, they can be acted upon. But it is difficult to expect and difficult to implement 
that every complaint is acted upon immediately and with that kind of an efficiency given the fact that there are too many complaints and too many people, too less people to act upon it. Uh, what advice in, on, in Vigilance Awareness Week would you like to give to your fellow government servants who, uh, who might be afraid, I mean, of discharging their duties because of, you know, the, the monitor, the watchdogs on them? And would you like to differentiate between, you know, the general public and social activists because they are already at the forefront trying to, you know, change society and some of them may not be actually, uh, you know, there with the right intentions. Some may have vested interests. As far as the government servants are concerned, I always say one thing, go by the book. You must follow the laid down procedures and every decision taken by a government servant should be recorded in writing and it should carry its reasons. It should be a transparent one. Tomorrow, six months later, if you are not there in that seat, somebody reads the file, he should understand for what reason you. They may find fault with my reasoning, but I must have a reason. Unless they attribute a motive that my, I have deliberately adopted a wrong reasoning, but at least I must express the reasons for which I take a decision. The other thing as far as government servants are concerned is, there are so many things happening in their own organizations, but most people don't speak up. Forget about public not speaking up. To take the case of banks. In the banks, we have such huge number of NPS. I am not on the issue whether the NPS were on account of a malafide intent on the part of the people who sanctioned the loans or who took the loans, but on the very process. Some loan has been sanctioned based on wrong documents which are prima facie wrong. After sanction, without obtaining the necessary documents, monies have been released. And this cannot be done by one. It is not being done by the CMD or the GM. It is being done down the line. How is it that nobody in the bank raises an alert? So that urge to report a misconduct, a potential risk to the organization, your alma mater, that is somewhat has to be developed. Coming to the public, as I told you, we have all along been talking about the demand side of the corruption. You try and catch hold of the fellow, you prosecute him, you punish him, do this and that. All that has to be done. But the supply side of the corruption, namely the person who is giving the bribe, the person who wants to get the benefit, the person who wants to do jump the queue, we have never thought of him, except in an odd case when he is also prosecuted. We need to bring a change in the thinking of the people. I personally feel that there is a change coming with the younger generation, like last year I told, we went to nearly 5,000 schools and colleges and across the country okay. to take the message of uh, preventive uh, vigilance and uh, need for transparency, need for the probity. And this year we are again going to more number of schools and colleges, Gram Sabhas, then Chambers of Commerce, right. uh, trade and the professional associations, so that you involve people that even if a reasonable percentage of these people, they take it seriously and in their day to day life, if they are reminded that look I took a pledge yesterday morning, I am not going to do this, then you have saved a lot of trouble. Mr. K. V. Chaudhary, thank you very much for talking to us here on Candid Conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.